The creed is important. It is important because it, like a really good hymn, actually, takes all of what we believe about the Christian faith and compacts it, makes it very small and tight, and as a result, memorable. Even though up until this point, the Bible has not directly been read in this service, I would venture to say a lot of the Bible has been read by inference just because of all of the things that we have sung and said. The same is true for the creed. Because there is that one strain, one phrase in the creed that cannot directly be pulled out of Holy Scripture. And it's one of the things that, you, that unites us. That we can say it and we can say it together. The creed was actually originally written to help Christians, many of whom at that time were illiterate, learn the basics of the Christian faith in the midst of a very multicultural situation all around the Mediterranean where all kinds of people believed all sorts of things. Someone would come to the faith, they would learn the creed as a part of their preparation for baptism. And after they were baptized and knew the creed, someone else could come up to say, well, you know what I believe. Well, what's that? Well, I believe in the goddess of the moon. And the Christian would say, hmm. We believe in one God, the Father Almighty, me, the maker of heaven and earth. Oh, I don't think I believe in the goddess of the moon. In other words, it was a way that they could distinguish clearly and quickly what it was the scriptures taught, what they believed as Christians, as opposed to what other religions taught and what other people believed. I, I would want to say to you that that's how the creed is always meant to be used. It's to be instructional, it's to be something that we memorize, and it's something that we use as a kind of plan to examine when other people come and say things to us, well, does that line up with the faith that we believe or not? In other words, if it isn't in the Nicene Creed, number one, it is not required for Christians to believe, and if it stands against the creed, then that's something that we don't accept as Christians. Does that make sense? So it is important that we put this service around the creed for that very reason. Because the founding of St. Mark's Church was founded upon wanting to be a Christian church. A church that affirmed the things that Christians have always believed. And because that's so, we are true to our legacy by using the creed as the framework for this service. We're also true to our legacy by singing. You see, just as Christians were taught the creed as a way to help learn the gospel, so also with the hymns. We sing because it teaches our hearts the gospel. It teaches our minds the gospel. And it gives us a way for the depths of our spirit to communicate directly with God in a way that, you're right, Mrs. Williams, that sermons don't always connect. You see, to sing is to allow a part of our heart to speak. A part of our heart that may not actually be heard in the spoken word. Something happens when you begin to sing. The singers will understand. Something ignites inside. Something comes up that's bigger than something that you might hear or try to think about in a Bible study or a doctrine. It allows a part of us to come to the surface and communicate the deep part of who we are to God. You can feel it happen in the room, can't you? When people begin to sing and they begin to worship as they sing, it's like something shifts inside of the room. Something awakens inside of not just our individual hearts, but something happens to us in our totality in a way that connects us in the deepest part of who we are to God himself because God made us to communicate with the very depths of our spirit. It's not merely a mental exercise. Oh, and if worship, and especially singing, is only a mental exercise, then woe be to you. Because there is much you do not know <laughs> about Christian worship. Because Christian worship, and this is what we were told, is to love the Lord God how? With all of our heart, with all of our soul, with all of our mind, and all of our strength. 
And if we are seeing all of that, those parts of who we are, are in fact engaged in worship to God, such that when we are worshiping like that, it can change us. It can do things inside of our hearts that other things cannot. And so we're strengthened by it. We're built up by it. We're often convicted by it. We are even, in fact, restored by it. Something happens that is godly in us that God does. So to sing, not just to offer the creed, but to sing is part and parcel of who we are, and it has always been the case, which is why in both the Old and the New Testaments, what are we commanded to do, among other things, we're commanded by the scriptures to sing. And so I would encourage you, find a Christian genre of music that connects faith and heart and allows you to express that heart to God. I, I want to say to you, it actually doesn't matter what the genre is. It could be the glorious Christmas music of King's College, Cambridge. It could be Kirk Franklin's praise. It could be all kinds of things. There's the beautiful jazz settings of the Eucharist. I mean, the wonder of it is, is that we're all wired a little bit differently. And so there will be different strains of music that will appeal to each of us that will not just appeal to us, but will allow our hearts to sing. And when our hearts begin to sing, that's when worship starts to happen in a way that, that, that changes us on the inside. So I, I would encourage you to find a genre of Christian music that allows your heart to sing because that's what the scripture asks of us. Finally, lastly, the foundational piece for all of what we say, all of what we do, all of what we believe is the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. It is on that basis that we can say in this line of the creed, we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. You see, if we hadn't seen the resurrection in Jesus and the promises that he made as the resurrected Christ, that we would be with him forever, there would be no point to look for anybody's resurrection. We would have no basis on which to make that kind of faith claim because Christ has been raised from the dead, we who are in Christ will also be raised from the dead. Who was it that taught us about heaven? It was Jesus that taught us about heaven because he had been there and he came to earth to tell us about what was possible for us if we would only believe, including the profound, glorious, and deeply comforting promise of eternal life. That's what we have been given in Christ. So that when we say that we look for the resurrection of the dead, what we're saying is, is that on the time that God appoints, when we finally shed the limitations of this physical body, God will take the very depths of who we are and take us into his presence, into that place where it says in Revelation, there is no pain, there is no grief, where God wipes away every tear from every eye. And it is in fact the hope of that resurrection that actually makes sense of the things that we go through in this life. Because no matter how difficult it is, no matter how hard we, of what we go through, we know that no wicked or evil circumstance has the last word. That the last word is the resurrection of the dead. The last word is the life of the world to come. The last word is a heavenly Jerusalem. The last word is the defeat of sin and sickness and death, the devil and hell. All of that Jesus put under his feet when he was resurrected from the dead. And it is that hope that we have that allows us to be able to say, even in the midst of a mortal body, even in the midst of a world that is broken, what are we looking for? We're looking for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Not as escapism. We are not those people who say, we look for the resurrection of the dead, so I'm just going to do nothing until I die and go to Jesus. No, exactly the opposite. To say that we look for the resurrection of the dead gives us the faith, the hope, the purpose, even the spiritual energy to be able to tackle the things that are going on in this world 
because we know that there is a better world that God wishes to bring about, and therefore we're saying we want to be a part of that. And we want you to be a part of that. We want our city to be a part of that. We want our culture to be a part of that. We want our school systems to be a part of that. We want our neighborhoods to be a part of that. And because that is the case, we do roll up our sleeves, get involved in the things that are going on in our community, in our life, because the hope of the resurrection gives us what we need to look at even the worst difficulties in the face and say, you will not defeat us because Jesus has promised the resurrection of the dead. I want to tell you that takes courage. That takes courage. You all, of course, have heard about the tragedy, the terrible tragedy of the shootings in Oregon. And a part of what happened was with everybody on the floor, he would call someone up and he would say, tell me what your religion is. And if they said Christian, he said, well, you're going to meet your maker. Bang. It was said on, posted on Facebook in a bunch of places that probably one of the most courageous people on the planet was not the first Christian who died, but the second. Because she knew what was coming. What gave her the capacity to stand up knowing that it would cost her her life and still say that she was Christian because she knew that when the bullet in her, entered her body, she would be taken into the presence of the Lord. That's the glory of what God has given us. It seems to me Christians who believe in the resurrection of the dead are the ones who should be on the front line of what's going on, tackling the most difficult problems that our society has faced. We should be known in our culture as people of grace, wisdom, poise, courage, who can enter into the difficulties of life because we know that God has given us in Jesus the kind of wisdom, the kind of joy, the kind of capacity to say, God, give me what you want me to have that I might step in and bring that resurrection life into this very problem, into this very difficulty. So to say that we look for the resurrection of the dead is not merely a final hope. They're present marching orders because we know that death is defeated. The curse has been broken. We have been set free. And therefore, I want to say to you, family of God, that if you are people who genuinely believe in the resurrection, how you start your day is to say, Oh Lord, I know life's going to be hard. It could be really difficult today. I don't know what's coming. Some of what I do know is coming makes me wish I would go back to bed, actually. But I know that you have put the resurrection of the, the dead in me by your Holy Spirit. So I can meet today with your grace, with your mercy, and with your confidence, so that no matter what happens, you hold me in the palm of your hand because you've resurrected from the dead. And as the scripture says, nothing can separate me from the love of Christ. And when the time comes, I too will go and meet you, even so that I am not defeated. I am not defeated. So the creed is more than just something that we recite on Sunday. It actually gives us a way to live, a way to walk in this world in the way the Christians at their best have always walked, with humility, with winsomeness, with a sense of humor, even in the midst of difficulty, and the capacity to give, be generous, and be courageous in the midst of a world that is growing more and more and more afraid. We live in an era where people are terrified. Can we not be those men and women who can say, God has not given us the spirit of fear. Why? Because we know that we will be resurrected with Christ and that we are looking forward to a new heaven and a new earth. And because that's the case, death is defeated. The devil has been broken by his, in his power because that's what Jesus did. And therefore we can walk into those places of death and difficulty. So today, my prayer is that St. Mark's Hain City and all of the wonderful Christians that have come to help celebrate this great and wonderful occasion. Thank you for being here. We do say in the creed, we believe in one church. 
And that means all of us in the room are sisters and brothers in Christ. Regardless of whether you're Presbyterian or Episcopalian or Methodist or Roman Catholic or AME or Pentecostal, we're all one in Christ. Amen. Is to say, can Haines City begin to know that there are Christians here who say, we want to bring the resurrection of Christ to this city. We want to see God's power, his wondrous love, touching the streets of Haines City making a difference in the life of this community because God has given us what we need to be able to step in because we look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. <laughs>